Well, it's a great pleasure and a privilege to be here and to be able to talk to you and to be part of this wonderful, <laughs> wonderful movement. And we really have to be together against cancer because it's a big, very big enemy. And just to put things into context before I start on my real subject, which is the Gerson therapy, I'd like to mention something that caught my eye in the paper a few days ago. It was a small news item, and it said that 30% of all children up to the age of about 15 who present at an A&E department of some hospital in this country, 30% of them is diagnosed with cancer, children. And I suddenly thought, well, it's about 10 years since we allowed our children right from toddlerhood up to have electronic devices on their persons and use them almost day and night, could there be a connection? We know about electrosmog, that it's dangerous, it's bad. So that was one thing. You know, they used to say that cancer was a disease of the middle-aged and elderly, and that is no longer true. And every now and then, some very eminent oncologists tells us that in our lifetimes, one out of every three of us will develop cancer, and another <clears throat> 15 or 20 years, it will be every other person. Now, that always feels like a slap in the face, because if every other person goes down with cancer, who is going to look after whom? But the point is that we seem to accept these dire prognostications. We seem to accept it. Nobody seems to ask why. Why doesn't anybody ask why? Why do we accept cancer as, we are not supposed to call it an epidemic, but quite frankly, the temptation is strong. Why do we behave as if it came from outer space? Or if it were the punishment of some angry god? It's not. We are causing it ourselves. And as long as we don't look that straight in the face and accept the consequences, things are going to get worse. To put it into a, a hazelnut shell, when I say that <clears throat> we are causing the trouble to ourselves, what I mean is that because of our enormous technological development, especially over the past, say, 50 years or so, we have completely forgotten that we are parts of nature. The same as a, a blade of grass, or a cat, or a dog. We are parts of nature, and we live as if we weren't. Look at it. Look at everything that we are doing, our lifestyle, our nutrition, the electrosmog, which I already mentioned and which is getting worse by the day, the stress which we accept as a kind of given. All these things contribute to undermining us as an organism, as part of nature. And the consumer society is particularly good at making us forget that we are not one lot of wonderful creatures here, and nature as a sort of second-rate something which we exploit there. No, it's like this. So why I'm saying is, all this is that unless we stop this symptomatic treatment, which at the moment is happening, I don't mean medical treatment, I mean uh, the general stuff which we put into public opinion, Unless we stop this and look at how we can revert to some sort of more natural life, and by life I mean everything that concerns us, 
we won't be able to fight cancer successfully. So this takes me more or less straight to my real subject, <clears throat> which is the Gerson therapy. Before I say anything else, let me point out that I am not saying that this is the only valid and successful alternative, that's what it is, therapy for cancer. I am not saying that. I don't believe that there is one solution. I do believe that this particular therapy, which has a very good track record for lasting now over 70 years, and which is a complete system, as I shall explain in a moment, and it is the one which I know intimately. So please accept this as a presentation of my personal experience and also my work with other patients over the past 30 years, since my own recovery, as something which I want to present as simply and clearly as possible. Let me start with my own story, and it, it's rather poignant because um, what Larry mentioned, this friend of his, with stage four metastasized malignant melanoma, which is exactly what I had. I was diagnosed in 1979, <clears throat> small mole, it's always a small mole. Um, it was accidentally discovered whilst I was being examined for something else. And um, I was <clears throat> very soon, you know, it's like falling into a huge vacuum cleaner once you get into the medical system, it sort of sucks you in. <laughs> um, and it was diagnosed as malignant melanoma, and I had extensive surgery. And I mean extensive, it removed a large part of my right leg. And skin graft, pretty horrible. And it took me about two months to be able to walk again and go back to work. And after that, all I had to do was to visit my extremely kind and humane oncologist every four or five weeks for a checkup. Nothing else. In fact, what he said to me was, go home and resume your life where you had left it off, which couldn't have been worse advice, because I, I obeyed. I went back to my much-loved but very stressful job, 25 cigarettes a day, um, eating in the BBC canteen, which has felled stronger people than me, if you do it long enough. Uh, and going on as if nothing had happened. Well, guess what? A year later, it was back. And this time, it had got into the lymphatic system. Now, meanwhile, as a good journalist, I did my own research into melanoma. So I knew quite a bit about it. And I realized that this was very bad news indeed. Once it gets away from the original spot, and especially into the lymphatic system, which, as you know, covers the whole body, there isn't a lot you can do. My oncologist immediately wanted to operate again and remove, he said, oh, just the lymph glands, as if it were a sort of little thing like a haircut, and then see what else can be done. Well, ordinary common sense said inside me, if the first operation didn't solve the problem, the second one would just weaken me even further. And you can't go, go on slicing a human being as if it were a piece of salami. And what happens, for instance, if, if the melanoma, as I knew it often did, got into my brain? You cut off the head or what? So there was a, an enormous resistance in me, and I just said, well, I need to think about it. Um, very fortunately, um, my best friend, who was with me all along, took me home, gave me a very powerful cup of tea. I think she put some rum into it, because it had a kick like a mule, but I needed it. And she started ringing her friends, acquaintances, asking them if they had any ideas about um, some sort of cancer treatment. And one of them, 
said, why doesn't she try the Gerson therapy? And we said, the what? Anyway, it then transpired, and I don't know if you notice that in your own lives, that once you make a good decision, things begin to form a sort of chain reaction, and one thing leads to another. And this is what happened to me. After we decided to look into this, whatever it was, it transpired that Dr. Gerson's granddaughter, Margaret, happened to be living in London. So there I was, the door opened. Very quickly, I went to see her. She said, until I've read her grandfather's book, she couldn't really do very much for me. So I did the fastest reading in my life, day and night. And that's when a sort of enormous light went up in my mind, because what I read in Dr. Gerson's book made sense. It was incredibly logical. And to sum it up as briefly as I can, he maintained that cancer was not a thing, namely the tumor, but it was a process which involves the whole body. And unless the process is being stopped, there is no reason why the cancer shouldn't recur. Well, yes, quite. <laughs> there are two reasons for disease, serious disease, to set in. One is deficiency. In other words, we eat what we think is good for us, but it isn't. And the body doesn't get the nutrients it really needs to be and remain healthy. This deficiency builds up over the years, of course. And the other reason is toxicity. Now, we live in a toxic world. That's not news, unfortunately. Um, air, water, soil, everything is polluted. Again, we've done it. It wasn't God. Um, the immune system developed over millions of years to deal with natural dangers, such as bacteria, viruses, um, whatever natural attack can reach the human body, it was not built to do all that, plus all the polluting toxic stuff that is, is being thrown at us every day of our lives. Hence, the immune system is no longer able <clears throat> to destroy and eliminate the cancer, the I won't call them cancer cells, the irregular cells which everybody, everybody produces every day of their lives. Two or three of them sit around, clump together, another tiny push, and the tumor begins to form. But by that time, the whole body is sick. So this is the Gerson basic principle put into very, very simple terms. And I quickly looked at my lifestyle and I thought, well, yes, of course I have cancer taking everything into consideration, <clears throat> it's surprising that I'm still alive. So then I went back to Margaret and said, I would like to do this uh, therapy of your grandfather's, but um, I don't know how, and what a pity there isn't a Gerson clinic anywhere. And she said, but there is. So I said, why didn't you tell me? And she said, because you didn't ask. <laughs> anyway. I then decided to do this. I told my, my bosses at the BBC who were terribly supportive. Um, and within, I found a, a holistic physician here in London who undertook to monitor me. And within a few, I think two or three weeks, I was in Mexico. And I was thrown in at the deep end, by which I mean that you arrive there and um, you are immediately told what's going to happen. But what's going to happen is not a picnic. Um, you get 13 glasses of freshly made vegetable and fruit juice a day, every hour on the hour. You get three huge meals of strictly vegetarian, strictly organic stuff, fruit, veg. You have to have coffee enemas to detoxify your liver. This is where most people turn pale and say, coffee enemas, yes. Uh, medically justified. 
it cleanses the liver, which is full of toxins. You know that the liver has to deal with all the toxins which we ingest. And eventually, just there is more toxin than liver. So five coffee enemas a day. Every other day, a fair amount of castor oil. And this goes on and on and on. And a certain amount of medication. I don't want to go into that. It is all natural stuff meant to promote your digestion and, and strengthen the body and give it all it needs. I should add that uh, at the time I had also been diagnosed with um, early stage diabetes, uh, adult onset, type 2. And I was having arthritis in my right hand. I only mentioned these because when I was examined very thoroughly by a most glamorous Mexican woman doctor. She looked like a film star. Um, I told her about the diabetes and I said, what are we going to do about that? And she said, nothing, it'll go. Eh? I thought diabetes doesn't normally go. It comes, but it doesn't go. However, I didn't want to argue. And I said, and my arthritis? And she said, don't worry, that'll go too. Um, three weeks later, three weeks on this intensive therapy, um, another blood test was done and there was no sign of diabetes. Gone. I thought after this anything can happen. And the arthritis went, look, no trace. So I said, yeah, but what about the melanoma? <laughs> and they said that takes a little longer. Well, it did. I was in Mexico for two months on this therapy. Let me tell you, it's monotonous, it's very tough. Your body begins to detoxify and you feel like it was a mistake to be born. Much better you know, to be out of this. You feel really dreadful. Everything aches. You have every possible sim symptom of the flu, except you don't have the flu and so on. I'm only telling you this because I don't want to give the impression that you drink your juices and have your nice enemas and after that everything's hunky-dory. You have to survive the therapy <laughs> uh, whilst you survive the cancer. Anyway, after two months I came back to London where, thanks to Margaret's help, everything had been organized for me. My house was turned into a small Gerson clinic with juicer and distilled water and Huge, huge sacks of carrots everywhere. It looked quite odd. And I continued with this for two years. So what started in January 81 ended in March 83. But before you really feel sorry for me, I should add that as you get better, the therapy is gradually phased out or rather diminished, so that after the first year, uh, you already can go down to 10 juices and three enemas, and you feel as if you'd been born again. You know, it's fantastic. The main thing is to understand, and Dr. Gerson insisted on this, that until your liver is totally restored, you are not cured. And you may look and feel very well. But don't stop the therapy, because you'll have a recurrence. And he was perfectly right about that. So there were funny bits. For instance, um, I was looking so well and healthy that I began to worry about my friends who came to visit me, because they looked awful. <laughs> they had no healthy color, and their <laughs> eyes were all yellow, and they were the wrong weight. And I thought, oh dear, what shall I do with my friends? And they looked at me and said, what's the matter with you? <laughs> Why are you doing this? Anyway, so we played around with this. And meanwhile, I read and studied the Gerson therapy and all the publications I could get hold of, because I felt that if I can recover on this crazy therapy, I want others to know about it. That was that. And since March 83, which is now, what, 30 years? Yes, it is over 30 years, I have been on what is known as a Gerson maintenance, 
which simply means that I am very careful about what I eat. I don't smoke, I don't drink. On holiday, I drank two glasses of red wine and felt really awful, but it was quite nice wine. Um, no stress, no harmful habits, and I am deeply, deeply involved in the Gerson work. Not being a medical person, my only possibility to help is to give information, which is what I'm doing. The first thing in that area was um, to write my book, which is called The Time to Heal, which is now in its fourth English edition and has been translated into eight languages, simply to give information. And <coughs> then it's up to people to make their own decisions. Meanwhile, lots of lovely things happened. In this country in 1993, another recovered patient and I founded the Gerson Support Group for the simple reason that interest was becoming quite strong. And, uh, excuse me, this other patient and I had about 25 phone calls every day and we just couldn't cope anymore. So we founded this group, which is alive and well and flourishing, and um, three of my lovely colleagues are sitting in Monto in the third row there, those three, and they are doing fantastic work, and I'm trying to help as much as I can. So we represent um, the Gerson therapy in this country, as I say, purely for information. Since 20... Nine, I'm in 2009, a Gerson Health Center is functioning in Hungary, near Budapest, which I helped to establish. And it's been functioning nonstop. We are getting cancer patients from all over the world who go there for two weeks at a time. They learn the therapy, theory and practice, and everything is, is shown and demonstrated, and then they go home and have medical follow-up. So that's already quite something. Um, we have a number of publications. Charlotte Gerson, who is Dr. Gerson's youngest daughter in her 92nd year and still working in California. Charlotte and I wrote a book which is called Healing the Gerson Way, which is a handbook for people who really want to find out what this is all about. That has been translated into, I think, 10 languages now. So what we are trying to do is to show that there is another way. Now, this is not putting down what orthodox medicine is doing. It's simply that it's not doing enough to build up the body so that it can actually fight the cancer. And I should add, I should have said this before, that the Gerson therapy isn't just for cancer because it works on the principle of restoring the body to such an optimal condition that it can heal itself. And that's what's happening. You restore the immune system, it's beginning to, to work again. So that there are very good success stories about people with heart and circulatory problems, kidney insufficiency, liver problems, all kinds of rheumatism, detox, detoxify the body and you suddenly feel quite different, and so on. Non-malignant conditions on the Gerson therapy can be treated more quickly and less intensively. In fact, compared to if one only has liver disease or diabetes, compared to what the malignant disease receives, it's almost a picnic, not quite. So this is the situation at the moment. And things are moving, actually. They are moving in the right direction. Partly because people are better informed about health and disease. And whatever nasty things we, stay, we say about the internet, it certainly has its good side too, if you use it with sound judgment and don't fall for every uh, beetroot cured my cancer sort of uh, weekend recovery. 
people are better informed, people are asking more questions. The, I think I'm not exaggerating if I say that the world's most experienced Gerson therapist, Catherine Alexander, who lives in Australia, uh, she's English actually, and she has been working on a book called The Smart Patient, which is simply to inform you, me, everybody else, what's happening in our bodies and what should we do about it. So you see, there is a kind of very modest groundswell of people beginning to understand that just dealing with the tumor is not enough. Now, coincidentally, I found this the other day and I was thrilled to bits. And it is the report of researchers from the Eberhard Karls University in Tübingen, Germany. And the researchers have demonstrated that the immune system has the capability to drive tumors and cancerous cells into a state of permanent dormancy. Quotes, it's very likely that we can't win the war on cancer by exclusive military means, said the lead researcher. Instead, it will be an important milestone to restore the body's immune control of malignant tumors. Sounds like Dr. Gerson, a uh, hundred years late, but <laughs> never mind. So I'm very hopeful that we are getting somewhere together. It's very important, together. And sharing the information and sharing advice and just realizing that we can stop this scourge. We made it, we can stop it. When you use the words alternative medicine, a lot of people get very cross. And they imagine that anybody who deals with alternative medicine must be some sort of a hippie sitting under a bush and smoking cannabis and doing something good as well. <coughs> and I'd like to point out that Dr. Gerson was the most conservative doctor you could wish for. He trained at three of the most prestigious German, he was German, German universities, and he had absolutely no time for charlatans. He was very, very intolerant of them. And if anybody is less like a hippie sitting under a bush, it would be Dr. Max Gerson. He was very strict. And he, he was also a scientist who was deeply into research. He didn't, didn't take anything for granted. He wanted to find out what was behind it or underneath it. Now, he was having very good results with TB before antibiotics came in, and TB was known as the White Death because there was so little you could do about it. He had good results with that. He had good results with cancer. And at the very moment when he was supposed to present his findings to a very high-level medical committee in Berlin who said if the results were justified, they would fund his work. Hitler came to power, 1933, and Dr. Gerson was Jewish, and he had to flee with his family. And via France and England, eventually he ended up in the United States, in New York City. Having got free of the Nazi persecution, he was then persecuted by the American Medical Association. Not quite in the same way, but everything he did was counteracted and canceled and not allowed to see the light of day because his results were so good. Now, this is one of the most tragic aspects of this whole story, which I'm telling you. He was not the first pioneer and the first genius, and I used the word advisor, he was a genius, who had to suffer for being right. So that he had the most terrible time. He got to the States in, I think, 1937, and he died in 1959. 
having just managed to publish his book, which is called A Cancer Therapy, results of 50 cases. And all along, he had his hospital privileges withdrawn, his papers would not be published, his results would not be published. I mean, every single thing was done to frustrate him. And he carried on and went on and on and healed people. He died in 59, he was in his late 70s. And it transpired that he had been poisoned. Because after his death, it wasn't quite clear why he had died. And then they found arsenic in his body. And he never had anything to do with arsenic all his life. And then his family recalled that coming back from a medical conference, he told them that somebody gave him a, a cup of coffee and it tasted very odd, but he didn't want to be rude, so he drank it. There we are. But his work lives on. And sometimes we have a little in-joke in Gerson circles that there is Dr. Max Gerson sitting in heaven, looking down. And every now and then, he grabs one of us by the neck and says, you. He grabbed me by the neck 30 years ago, and I still can feel his hand. And I don't mind. I'm very grateful. <coughs> It is difficult, and um, I had help from my mother and one or two friends. And then I thought, well, if I die, I won't be expected to repay the money anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and if I recover, I can work again and I can repay it. And this is what happened. But this is a very good point you are making, because one of my great heartaches is that in order to do Gerson, you need money because nobody will fund it. And I think it's dreadful that life or death and recovery should be rationed by whether you can pay for your carrots or not. I think it's terrible. And look at the cost of chemotherapy. That's not for free, but we don't have to pay for it. Part of the treatment is to release toxins from the liver. Yes. Um, when that happens and the toxins go into the bloodstream, is that not damaging to the body? They don't go into the bloodstream, they go out through the usual channels. <laughs> because remember, you had a coffee enema, which means water. So the water had gone into the gut. Uh, the caffeine in the coffee uh, stimulates the production of bile in the liver. So there is a flow of bile, and that, together with the remains of the coffee enema, goes out. It doesn't go into the bloodstream. That would be a catastrophe. <laughs> the Gerson therapy, as such, has no opening, no room for psychological support, because he was a medical doctor, and he wanted to keep it absolutely straight, scientific, and medical. Personally, I am totally committed to the body-mind link. And being a psychotherapist, I couldn't do anything else, could I? And um, in my own experience, going through this very rigorous two years, I know what enormous fluctuations you experience if you are ill. And as your body tries to do its best, and you detoxify. Now, the toxins go through, among other places, the central nervous system and the brain. When that happens, you turn into a homicidal lunatic. You get angry, you are rude, you are furious, you break up the best china. I'm not kidding. When I look back at the things I did during these episodes, I'm deeply ashamed. Uh, anyway. So, yes, it is important. It is important not to comfort patients too soon, because all you do is make them repress their feelings. Feelings have to come out. And particularly when you have the, the dreaded flare-up, which is, isn't just mental, it's also physical. I always told patients I worked with that they should say to their dearest and nearest, 
I love you dearly, and I'm going to behave extremely badly. Please don't take any notice of it. It's only a flare-up. This was a kind of formula <laughs> which we passed on to each other. But particularly because of your interest and what you do, and we'll hear from you later, yes, I do confirm that the psychological support is very, very important. And it's got to be the right kind. Thank you.